Yeah, let's go ahead and pray for Joshua Barnett, too. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you and I praise you. Lord, I just ask you now to be to Joshua Barnett. Lord, you know that he got into a, an accident and the car drove him for quite a while. Lord, you know he's not doing good. So we're asking you now to reach down and touch him and heal him. Lord, be with the family. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, I love Psalms, of course. You know, amen. But, but it's, it's really interesting. You got Psalms 22, which talks about the death, burial of, of Christ. Then you got Psalms 23 that talks about, yea, do I walk through the valley, the shadow of death. And then it says, then you have the holy hill. You have explaining who Christ is. See, you have him dying. You have him <coughs> leading us. But then you have him being king in those three verse in, in those three chapters right there. I want to look at today him being king. But the, the title of this message is Who is the King of Glory? Amen. Who is the King of Glory? You know, it, it starts out as uh, verse number of the point number one, the fullness of the earth. The fullness of the earth. See, we see this in point number one. Let's go ahead and pray before I even get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you and I praise you this morning. Lord, I thank you for the ones that came that, that's here today. Lord, we're right at the max where if we had any more coming in, we would have to go outside. But praise the Lord for it. But Father, I ask you now to fill me with your spirit. Speak through me today, Lord. Guide me, direct me. Lord, but fill each and every single listener with your spirit that they may glean something from your word. Help us all to take the cares of this world and set them aside today, Father, so we can hear exactly what you want us to hear. <coughs> Lord, we all love you and we praise you. We thank you for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Again, point number one is the fullness of the world. It says, the earth is the Lord's. Huh. It isn't mine. I didn't make it. I didn't create it. I didn't think it into existence. I just get to live on it. Think about it. When, when y'all had kids, or if you've ever had kids that have grown up now, how many of us have said, is this your house? Are you paying the bills? Do you have a job? No, no, no. God's making it real clear who the earth is, who owns the earth. It says it right here. The earth is the Lord's. Period. Amen. There's no arguing that. It is his. He's the creator of it. And then it says, the fullness of thereof, the earth of the upper world, and they that dwell in it. Hold on a minute. Hold on. Back that train up. The earth is the world. Uh, the, the earth is God's, right? The Lord's. Then it says, the fullness thereof, thereof. So that's also God's. But then it says something else. Them that dwell where? Therein. Therein. So, God created us. We're his. Amen. But hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <clears throat> this is where it gets touchy. Well, preacher, you do said that not everybody's God's. People. That's true. But here it's saying, we're all his. We're all his creation. There's a difference between being his family and being his creation. Right. There's a difference there. So let's we gotta make that clear. Is because there, we we don't want this thing of, well, 
you know, everybody's a child of God. No, <laughs> no. My Bible says who is a child of God is. The ones who accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, that's a child of God. But everybody is his. He, he can tell anybody if he really wanted to and make them do what he wanted them to do. He could have, but in the beginning, said, okay, everybody's going to believe that I am God, period. Boom. Everybody believes it. But God didn't want that. I say it this way. God didn't want robots. God, God wanted us to make the choice ourselves to love him for who he is. To accept him for who he is. Not, yes, Lord, I'll do what you want me to. No. He wants us to make that choice. Even though that this world and everything that dwells within it is his, but he still allows us to make the choice to trust in him. So, you know, the fullness thereof. What, what is that? Okay. The fullness thereof. That's everything. Now, preacher, that's kind of vague. Well, that's the truth. Everything. All the fruit. If we go on just talk about food, all the fruit, all the animals, everything. All the fish in the sea and the lakes and the waters are his. The fowls of the air are his. Do you feed them? Do you take care of them? Do you shelter them? The answer is no. Who does that? God himself. He feeds them. He takes care of them. He shelters them. All the money in the world, I think Brother Hudson was saying this, all the money in the world could only feed the animals of the world one day. Hmm. And God does it 365 days a year. Why? Because they're His. Amen. Now think about this. What about our houses? Well, we used whose wood? Whose trees? Who's metal? Think about it. Everything on the earth is his. But then there's still more to this. And then it says, and he findeth, excuse me, he, he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. He has founded it. Not us. There's nothing that we can do to create anything. Because the things that we are using to create is what? His stuff. Right. Can you imagine if God allowed you to do to, to create something out of thin air? What if God said, okay, Jacob, you can have control over your body for three minutes. You can have control over everything. You know what would happen? Jacob would be dead in 3.3 seconds. If that. Because he would have to, to tell his brain to think, to, to tell his heart to pump and tell the blood to move, everything. We can't do that. God can. God has done God has created everything upon the waters. Remember what it said? That the earth come out of the Where did the dry land come out of? The water. Upon the flood. The floods. Think about it. Chapter 6 of Genesis. Thou come out of the worldwide flood. Man, he created everything from eight people again. Think 
about this. He, it doesn't say it, but we have to read in between the lines on this. <clears throat> in Genesis chapter 6, it talks about the flood, right? They were in the ark for a little over a year or so, give or take. Everything was under water. Right? Right. But when the ark, ark landed, those trees already had leaves on them. Because the dove brought what back? An olive branch. <clears throat> See, he had to recreate everything. He doesn't say it, but he had to. Everything was destroyed. How could within a year those trees be growing again? How could, or a year and a half, those trees be full, full grown? How could there be all these things going on again when they were underwater for over a year? Hmm. See, with that time, I think about the flux. It's his. He's established it. Let's go on. Verses 3 and 4, this is coming out of. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Let's look at it. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in the holy place? He that has clean hands, a pure heart, who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor Sworn defeat, the sworn defeat. Hmm. None of us, none of us. We've all have done wicked things. We all don't have pure hands, clean hands. None of us in this room. What are you saying, preacher? Go and witness to this person here. This might be the last day that he's ever on earth. You don't witness till he dies. God told you to go. His blood is on your hands. See, there's none of us on the face of this earth that can ascend or stand in the holy place. None of us. So who? Who? They're asking the question, who? We know the answer to that, but we'll get into it. But we can't. The Bible says our righteousness is our filthy righteousness. None of us is worthy enough to stand there. None of us can ascend to the holy hill from above. None of us. Who has done that? See, we got to remember why we're here. Can we have a pure heart? Amen. Yes, we can. We can have a pure heart. But our hands look at it again, it says how many of us have lifted up our souls to vanity? Think about it. It's getting awful quiet in here. Vanity. Vanity. Say it, preacher. Oh, vanity is vanity. Do you, do you know what vanity means? Nothing. Nothing. That's what it means. There's nothing to grab. When we lift up our hearts or our souls, when we just start desiring things that mean nothing, 
because they're not ours to begin with, buying a boat. Melissa said it just this week. I know she wasn't talking about buying a boat. She says, you know, if we had a boat, well, we could go down the river. And Jordan says, yeah, we would be so, so this, this, this thing, or whatever it's called. I tried to say it right, still didn't do it. But anyway, uh, being up, spreading apart because there, there's more, with five of us, with six feet apart, that would be easy. See, but if I took that to heart, I said, oh, Melissa must be to go by a boat. Take, take the hard earned money that we are saving for this or that or for, for vacation and say, no, we're going to go buy a boat instead. That's bad. That is too. No, the, the, well, we really want to go and do things as a family. We have a boat, but how are we going to tow it anywhere? Because my car is not going to tow a boat. Melissa's car is not going to tow a boat. That means I gotta go buy a pickup truck, Jacob. No, but the, 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 you see, it, it, it just doesn't stop with a boat. That means I have to buy a pickup truck powerful enough to pull a boat. But that also means that I get to have two different kind of payments that I'll struggle with. See, we've got to remember Vanity is just that. It's vanity of vanities. Just read Ecclesiastes, it shall go to other. Think about this, guys. Our, our, what we have done, but we can't do what it's asking for someone to do. Let's go on. Let's look at verse 5. And he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and the righteousness of God of the salvation. And this generation of them that seek him, that seek in his face, O Jacob, see Point number three, who shall receive the righteousness of the Lord? This one we can do. This one we can, but that first one we couldn't. We can seek the Lord. We can seek His face. We're doing it today. We're in church seeking God. Whose righteousness? Whose righteousness does it say here? Let's look at it. <coughs> The Lord and the righteousness from God. God's righteousness. See, when we seek the Lord and we accept Him for who He is, we have what is right here it says salvation for them that who are seeking God. See, we have the right. We can not the right. We have, we're the ones here that will get the righteousness of God. We are. Old generation. Next verse, it says what? The generation? Of uh, this generation, excuse me. See, we're in the perfect time of all history. The perfect time. Even today, with the with everything that's going on, the pandemic that quote unquote we have, revival can bust out. Clarence Sexton in in Northern, in Tennessee, he he is verbally well. Actually, I got an email from him, but he says this: Our president is the president who's going to bring revival. To our country. What is he talking about? Revival means to what? To be revived again. Revived. To bring life again. Mm -hmm. See, we're, we are so worried about 
the country not abounding or not picking back up. We have the perfect man that God has put in place. A perfect man, well, as a man go. But think about this. He's a businessman, right? He has lost his money four times, bankrupt. Four times. But you know something? He's always came back. Bigger and stronger than what he was before. Money wise, I'm talking about. So why are we worried about the country when we have someone that knows how to build a business? To build the economy. See, that's not what I'm talking about. But true revival in America. We need to really start praying for that. Through this time, such a time as this, the Bible would say, this is what we have to be praying for. You know, we have so many people right now on any given day that you can look at the, the ones that you can look at the um, how many times the, the Facebook has been viewed and stuff like that. We've had over 200 people viewing the messages on a few of our messages on my news page. That's never happened before. Never. And we've had that pattern going out to five, six hundred people, different people receive the message. Or at least a video. They've reached. Can we have revival this time? Oh yes. Even in churches now that are spread all over the country. Right now, if you think about it, we have more churches in our country than we've had in a very, very long time. Everybody that's on Facebook, that's listening to our Facebook pages or our YouTube page, when they're, when they're sitting down and they're breaking their Bibles open and they're listening to what's being said, they're having church in their house. <laughs> 200 people or 200 home households that have been reached, let's say it this way. Let's say they only have three people in the household. Do the math. That's 600 people. That message is reached. Now, Facebook or YouTube, we've had, I think the biggest is 19 or 53, I think it was. People reached. Three people. Do the math. Can we still have revival in this pandemic? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And he will. See, we can be so scared and do nothing, or we can continue to do what we're doing. And reach more people. Because more people are searching for the truth. Right. Have you ever noticed when things go wrong, more people search for God? Let's go all the way back to 9 11. Remember that day, the ones who were alive. Remember that day. I remember the next weekend. Our church was full. The weekend after that, it was standing room only. Matter of fact, the pastor was asking us to give up our seats for us to stand and let the visitors come in and sit down. See, we missed the boat, America. We as Christians missed the boat. Because we forgot to go and to follow up with them. 
If, if every church would have continued following up with these people, sure not all of them would have been back. But I believe that we would have had started having a revival back then. God is giving us another chance to have revival in America. Who this generation, <clears throat> such a time as this, who shall have the righteousness of God? The ones that seek his face. Think about it. We can have it. We can do it. Point number four. Lift up your hands. How many times in a Baptist church do you see people who have raised their hand? Amen. I you know my father-in-law when, when when he gets into a, a song, he'll sit there and go, Amen. He does a karate chop in the air. <laughs> I'm only picking on him. But lift up your hands. Let's look at it. Verse 7. Lift up your hands, O gates. And be ye lifted up. Ye everlasting doors. The King of glory shall come in. Amen. There's, this reminds me of something else. Revelations 3, 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man heareth my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and him with me. Lift up your hands. Open your door of your hearts. Do you want revival? Lift your hands up. Pray to God. Open your heart to listen to what God has to say. You have everlasting doors. We have eternal life. We need to spread it. We need to let other people know. Verse 9. Lift up your heads. O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, ye everlasting doors, the King of glory shall come in. Amen. <clears throat> Not just lift them up. What he's saying is praise God. Start praising Him. We have so much to praise Him for. Even in this time, The song that we sung, Desiree picked that out perfectly, it goes with the message. I got so much to thank him for. I have been blessed. Beyond all measure. See, but we get stuck on the bad things. How many of us did love wearing a mask? I hate those things. I hate them with a passion. But you know something? Here it comes. When hunt season starts, guess what I'm going to wear? I'll wear that mask. Perfect. It's camouflage. It's perfect. I didn't even think about it until a couple of my hunter buddies at work said something about it. But then I told Jordan, if there's a way that we could figure it out to have it come around our ears, because our ears are one thing to get cold, it would be perfect ear ones too. <laughs> you know? But see, lift up your voice. Lift up your hands. Open your heart. And allow God to do the work that he needs to do. Verse 8, it says, who is the King of glory? The Lord, strengthened and mighty, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Amen. Point number five is the title of the message. Who is the King of glory? 
Who is the King of Glory? Well, Hutchins just said, God. But that's in the, that's part of my last point. But anyway, who it is? We know who it is. And even before then, <laughs> even before he's asking the question here, he's telling us what we need to do. We need to worship him. We need to worship the king. Not David, because I choose who wrote this, not David, but the true and one king. God himself. We need to worship him. Why? He's strong. He's mighty. His strength is what carries us. For his might. His strength is what makes things grow. His mighty carry. Think about this, guys. We have someone that we can worship, that we can sing about. Then lastly, <clears throat> the Lord is the king of glory. Amen. The Lord is the king of glory. Who shall uh, who is the king of glory? This is verse 10. The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Selah. He is the king of glory. Selah means to stop and think about it. To meditate upon it. Who is the king of glory? The Lord himself. Jesus Christ is the king of glory. We have a personal relationship, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, with the King. Amen. As a matter of fact, He calls us His children. You can't get any closer than that. Think about it. We are His children. We, of all people, should know who the King of Glory is. But unfortunately, even people that have accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior are still 40 years and still babes in Christ. But they do know that one. You can ask them, who is, who is the Lord? Or who is the King of Glory? And at least they will say Jesus. They got that right. But see, we have the opportunity of really showing that. How do we do that? By the way we talk. But not just by the way we talk. By the way we act. By the way we act. Think about it. If we're all acting church and we praise God we lift our hands and hallelujah but then someone comes in our church building that's not so clean not so lives behind garbage can or something and we don't stay How many of us are going to go up to him and shake his hand? Think about it. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> but right now it's elbows, but, <laughs> but how many of us, how many of us would go out of our way to make him feel special? Or, or how many of us would say, hey, can sit by me, knowing that he smells future. Or how many of us would say there's a seat in the back? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my father in says, I can't smell, so it's not going to bother me. <laughs> but how many of us? <clears throat> I remember a couple people when we were at the thrift store, Mums. 
almost done. That would come into the store. His name was Caveman. Or his street name was Caveman. I met him. I we go here a long time. But after you get to know him, he was a lawyer in Pennsylvania. He was trying this guy that had stolen some clothes to keep himself warm. And he, and he pointed in his face when he was convicted and said, you could not live a month on the street. And that was over 20 years ago. But I'm talking, this guy, he stunk in. This guy stunk. Bad. As once you got to know him, he was, he was really nice. He was smart as a whip and everything else. After we got to know him, he would come in and give me a bear hug. I'm telling you, I smelled it for an hour or two. You know what I did back, Chuck? I gave him a bear hug back. Not as long as what he did for me, but you know, I did do it back. But see, are we willing to go that far to show the King of Glory? Are we willing to go that far to show people who Christ really is? We can all say we want revival, right? But are we willing to go the distance? Are we willing to go? Are we willing to show people Christ that stank? That people don't want to be around? See, we've got to remember if we want true revival, that means revival. It means that we're going to have to do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to let people know that Pioneer Baptist Church is still alive and still kicking yeah. and still fighting for God. Let everyone stand. Okay, we have Bob. I'm going to have one more split the piano. But I have Bob and then we have first.